a collective SADC approach. And then the third paper is by Muriuki Muriungi, who is a practicing advocate uh, with Kosegi, Muriuki, and um, at the uh, in Nairobi, um, and is also with the University of Nairobi. He's going to be speaking on legal options and approaches of managing and restructuring sovereign debt in the SADC region. The, the three commentators, um, and I suppose we'll go in this order as well, is firstly, Dr. Celine Tan, who is at the University of Warwick, and I think many of you might know her from her, her work on sovereign debt, but also with the International Economic Law Collective, uh, which if you don't know about, uh, would be a good thing to learn about. Um, second one is Professor Makani Moise Mbengu from the University of Geneva, and I think probably most people know him from his distinguished career, both as a, an author and as a, um, an expert working with many international organizations. And is also the chair of the African Society of International Law. Uh, the third commentator is Professor, Professor Kenneth Mwenda, who works at the World Bank, um, but is also a very distinguished scholar and academic and has amongst these many publications, literally written the book on banking law in Zambia, um, and is a lecturer with, uh, in our LLM program at the University of Pretoria. Um, so with that, let me hand over, so, we, so each speaker will speak for about 10, 12 minutes. Um, to keep things moving, I, if you're going on too long, I will give you a warning, a two minute warning, just so we, we don't, we keep the, the discussion moving. Um, but let me hand over first to Roselian to, to do his presentation. Hello, everyone. How are you? Um, my name is, uh, as I've been introduced, is uh, Roselian Jackson, and I'll be presenting on how the sovereign date uh, is, has been addressed in the SADC model BIT. So um, by starting with is, this is how my presentation is based. We'll first look at the introduction on sovereign date and BIT. Then we'll uh, some, some highlight on how there is an intersection between sovereign date and, uh, and BIT. Then we'll look specifically and on the SADC model BIT, and then look at the achievement and challenges uh, on how the model BIT has been able to address uh, the goals of uh, in relation to sovereign date. And then uh, and lastly, I'll finish on some concluding remarks and recommendations. The definition of sovereign debt, uh, there is no agreeable definition, but in general is when a state is indebted either to another state or a multilateral institution, a corporation, or even individual. And when it fails to, to honor that date, then we have a sovereign date default, as how it happened uh, recently on, on Zambia. And when we say on bilateral investment treaties, these are uh, basically treaties between two countries on protection and promotion of uh, promotion of uh, uh, investment. As you can see on the slide. Those are some of BIT in Africa. There are quite many, and that's why we have, uh, this is very important discussion. And lastly here on the second part, I'll look on how then the sovereign date has defined, uh, has some relation on bilateral investment treaties. The intersection can be seen on different uh, main uh, perspectives, but the major one is uh, you look at the investment, how uh, the definition, some treatment in the model BIT, including the non-discrimination treatment, umbrella clause and stabilization clause. Then also you look at the standard of treatment of fair and equitable treatment. There is expropriation. And lastly, you look at the uh, settlement of dispute. Currently, we have only four cases which have addressed the question of sovereign date within the BIT framework, and none of them reached on merit. So starting with investment, the definition of investment can be categorized into three uh, parties. The first definition are those which are open list asset-based definition. We have a closed list uh, asset-based definition and lastly an enterprise-based definition. These are the major one, but they can be others. And for example, in the Angora, uh, Brazil uh, 
agreement on investment, they left it to the party to define what is the investment. So an example of an open list asset-based definition is the Italy Zambia BIT. Uh, and this uh, mostly is the one which have been subjected to, uh, to definition by courts in relation to sovereign day, uh, bonds. So under this definition, uh, courts have come up to say that specifically under this uh, definition, sovereign bonds are investment, as you can see on paragraph, uh, so paragraph B, based on my unofficial uh, English translation from Italian. And another sample of an open list asset-based definition is the German Zambia BIT. Although it does not specifically mention bonds, uh, uh, tribunal has come up that it might, uh, sovereign bond under this kind of uh, framework can also be an investment. And another is the closed list asset based definition. This does not, uh, it, it has based on asset, but it has a closed list of what can be an investment. As you can see on the Canada Tanzania BIT, based on this kind of BIT, sovereign bond are less likely to be investing because they are not mentioned or explicitly excluded, like when you look at the Canada model BIT. So under the SADC model BIT, we have that enterprises based definition. Under this kind of definition, it's most likely that sovereign bonds are not investment because they're expressly excluded. Uh, you can see that the excluded securities and mostly enterprises cannot, uh, in most cases, cannot be termed as to be an asset as uh, a sovereign bond is an asset. But the big issue is how the definition of BIT, uh, definition of investment at the BIT and that of the exist convention intersect when it comes to the question of jurisdiction before exit tribunals. So under the exit convention, it's most likely that sovereign bonds are invested. But under the BIT, then uh, parties to the dispute can limit what is the arbitrable. Then that's how the, the, the uh, exit tribunal can get uh, uh, jurisdiction when entertaining uh, a dispute concerning sovereign debt. So another part of it is the non-discrimination clause. So you find this basically the MFN principle, which uh, in most cases has been used by investors to import from other uh, treaties uh, definition or other better drafted uh, drafted this, uh, sub uh, terms as you can uh, as you can see in some cases uh, tribunal have allowed in some cases they partly allowed and in some cases they rejected so you can find that in the definition of investment, you do not include the term uh, sovereign bond, but investors can use uh, a BIT like in the Italy Zambia BIT when the question is the German uh, Zambia BIT, they can import the definition uh, from the Italy uh, Zambia BIT to be as part of the German uh, of the Zambia German BIT. So another thing is the closed umbrella clause and separation clause. This specifically uh, or directly, they don't, uh, they do not deal with uh, the question of sovereign bond, but they have some implications when it comes to the tribunal. An umbrella clause can extend BIT protection to contract, and as it happened in in the case of Ablaka, the investor were trying to use an umbrella clause to bring up that a contract or a, sovereign, a bond contract be termed as protected under the BIT. So this also can happen when it comes to sovereign bond and bilateral investment treaty. The stabilization clause on the other hand, this is specifically happens on, on contracts themselves and it can please a regulatory change of the state. You have, for example, in Tanzania, the Investment Act define and give jurisdiction to exit uh, to entertain um, a dispute between investors. So even if they want to change that, they for, uh, for, for contract which they signed with a stabilization clause, the Investment Act will still uh, be applicable to those kind of investors. The other is the fair and equitable treatment. 
in, in general, this uh, incorporates nearly anything which negatively impacts investment. Therefore, even the restructuring of invest uh, of sovereign bonds, when it has seen that it affects the investor, investor can use this uh, this uh, code of fair and equitable treatment to demand payment uh, 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 by to be given by tribunals. By looking at the SADC model BIT, they have uh, the SADC model BIT in first is the non-binding template for SADC member state to use in ad adopting new BIT which is state. So for the first thing they did, they expressly excluded sovereign bond as uh, investment. They also excluded uh, um, the MPN uh, and umbrella clause and the dispute settlement. Uh, they excluded, but they restricted uh, national treatment trust, uh, and the fair and equitable treatment in the way that there is a policy space for government. But another important thing is the transparency in the contract. They have included this that investor and state they should disclose and be transparent when it comes to contract. So the achievement we see is that the limitation and the exclusion of some uh, uh, terms which they have a direct implication when it comes to sovereign bonds. So the challenge they will face, I guess, is for the first thing is the political will that state are, are they ready to incorporate uh, the BIT to use it when in negotiating uh, uh, investment treaty with other states. Another thing is the state laws. They need to be harmonized. You see the, uh, the SADC BIT uh, do away with uh, uh, investor state dispute settlement. But you look at law, for example, of Tanzania, the Investment Act say that investor can use it. Another challenge is negotiation capacity. You have uh, many blocks in countries, they have their own model, which might have different terms with the SADC model BIT. So uh, are they ready to, to take the model and abandon their model? That's the first. And another thing is the left out clause. They, uh, they will be having very big impact on how are you going to negotiate that. Uh, they should agree uh, a, a BIT which doesn't have a most favorable national treatment. Another challenge is sunset clauses. You have sunset clauses when even if you terminate the current BIT to, uh, to use the, uh, the model BIT, still the, the investment will continue to be protected under the sunset clauses. So the, in conclusion is that the model has managed to exclude sovereign bonds from investment. However, there are some uh, difficult and it will take time for it to be implemented. Uh, for things which I have seen as uh, the suggestion is that the model should adopt forward-looking provision to help address future uncertainties. We have seen what happened with uh, the COVID-19. Uh, they did not expect that and even in their, uh, in their treaties, BITs, they did not provide for, for exception uh, even the force major exception in some treaties is not capable of working. So the idea is for new BITs, they should have some forward-looking provision to help address this future uncertainty. In my paper, I have suggested uh, something like a more, most favored state clause, which has the impact that state can borrow uh, some new attempts from other BITs just like the, uh, the MPN principle, but the, uh, the most favorable state uh, principle just works for, for, uh, for states and country in order first to harmonize and to have coherent on policy and help states which cannot uh, negotiate fully to enjoy some other negotiation which uh, happens by, by big or developed country which have strong negotiation uh, capacity. And this marks the end, uh, and I'll take back the floor to Daniel. Thank you very much, Rosalian. Um, and thank you for sticking to time. You, you've set an excellent example for everyone. Um, just before I hand over to the next speakers, just two things. Um, please, if, you, if you're not speaking, keep yourself on mute so that we don't get background noise. Also. Um, please remember there's a chat function and you should feel free at any time to put comments or questions in the chat function uh, and we can feed those to, to the presenters at any particular moment. But I, I think uh, Rosalia has given us a, a good start with 
and lots of food for thought and discussion there. Um, the next paper is by Jervin Naidu and Umesh Muramudali. Um, I'm not sure which of them we would like to speak first, but to... Uh, ah, Jervin, there you are. <laughs> Hi. We're we doing half-half, basically. Okay. I'll hand over to you and then you decide. So cool, the floor is you. yours. Cool. I'm going to share my screen. Um, Um, can you see these slides? We can see half of the slides. Okay, so just give me a second, sorry, Prof. Okay. Uh, can you guys see it now? Yeah. Okay, yep. cool. That works well. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bradlow. Uh, thank you, Makhali, for all your all your all your hard work as well in the communications um uh, we're quite honored to be presenting we're also uh uh yeah proud in the sense that also uh, we're both university of warwick graduates and professor ten is one of the commentators so it's nice to have an alumni as well on uh, commentating our paper so we'll be dividing our paper into uh, uh presentations i'll do half and the mesh will do the other half. we're keeping it nice and sweet and short as our paper is fairly dense all right, um, just the outline of how we came about writing the paper. We started off with an introduction and a rationale of the paper. And then we went into the root causes of sovereign debt in Africa. And then we looked at uh, renegotiating as a block. And then we obviously concluded with some recommendations and conclusions, which Umesh will do. All right, the introduction of the paper. So essentially we started talking about sovereign debt and one of the key sort of contextual backgrounds we gave is that SADC consists of 16 members within a block with a combined GDP of $721.3 billion and a population of over 345 million people. This uh, represents uh, immense human capital and immense resources and potential for the block to become uh, a major role player, not just in in Southern Africa, but in Africa and Africa as a whole um, in terms of developing its economy. However, the issue that we highlighted was that the persistent um, sovereign debt and unsustainably high levels of debt to GDP is becoming a co concern, especially when uh, SADC has seven uh, highly indebted poor countries and thus hinders their development is uh, the increasing debt uh, puts strain politically and economically on how they would like to move forward. Uh, as of 2015, uh, SADC's macroeconomic uh, ban target for sovereign debt was 60%. And up until about 2017, um, uh, most SADC countries were in that ban. However, the last two to three years, and especially with COVID now, we've seen uh, countries like South Africa and Angola go well over the 60% uh, uh, threshold, and even countries like Mozambique pushing over into the 100%. So it's becoming a really, really uh, challenging uh, issue. And we need to address this. And this is why we put forward uh, restructuring debt as a block. And in the introduction, we also mentioned that we are looking at debt in a holistic approach. It's not just a purely from an economic side or political side. That's why myself and Umesh uh, collaborated on this, myself being a political economist and Umesh being an economist to bring these two areas together. And on one final note, sovereign debt is what we call in the security studies field a, a wicked problem or even within global governance. When I say wicked problem, I mean, when you pull on one end of the string, it, it uh, vibrates and, and it hits many other factors. So you may think sovereign debt is purely down to uh, poor governance, but when you look into it, there are structural issues in the economy, political, economic, social. So you need a holistic view when looking at sovereign debt. And the next slide, Umesh, will take over. Umesh? All right, sorry, can you guys hear Is Umesh? He might be on mute. Okay. Sorry, Prof, sorry, sorry. We do apologize in, in Sri Lanka. Right. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, right. So basically, uh, as Jervin very correctly said, we are, we are taking a holistic approach to identify the root causes of the sovereign debt. 
in Sadek region. So uh, when we talk to, uh, when we talk about the sovereign debt, it is important to understand this in several dynamics from an economic perspective. Uh, so first we have to look at the government finance and then the balance of payment, uh, which includes all the external factors um, and also the government expenditure and the growth. Right. So these are not isolated concerns. So for this very reason, uh, when we analyze the root causes of the sovereign debt, we have to look into uh, the problem of government finance, whether there's enough revenue for the government and whether the government is investing enough to drive the growth, because these are the factors that subsequently bring down the level of debt and uh, makes uh, allow a country to uh, achieve the debt sustainability. And uh, also, we are focusing on uh, uh, the impact of foreign debt because foreign debt, unlike a domestic debt, has a geopolitical and political concerns too. For example, uh, in recent past, there's this whole narrative of Chinese debt trap. Whether uh, how far that is true or not is a separate thing to look at. But obviously, the foreign debt has geopolitical concerns that are attached to it. This includes uh, these things comes in various forms, which uh, includes uh, you know. Uh, the IMF or World Bank and most of the loans are provided with conditions. So these conditions subsequently uh, also intervene the sovereignty of a country and also it affects the economic decisions that countries take. It restricts them from taking economic decisions, for example, uh, like certain austerity conditions that uh, IMF would impose or certain other conditions that the World Bank impose. It doesn't mean that these are bad, but it's just that how it is. So uh, yeah, Jerry. So the, so the main, main crux of the paper was obviously renegotiating sovereign debt as a block. So we built our thought into what is considered a liberal IR, IR thought collective action, where it's built upon a win-win premise based on a pan-Africanist and basically based into the sort of Pax Africana plan of the African continental free trade, which essentially wants to generate trade amongst each other and build a strong economy, which pools some of its economic sovereignty. So when looking at SADC, SADC within its key seven strategies, they, there is some mandate for our, our, our solution. Some might think our solution might be too, uh, might be some, maybe somewhat unrealistic, but if you look at SADC's um, strategies, uh, particularly points two and four, it highlights the importance of integration and of SADC members working together to, to develop uh, its members, its economy, uh, technology transfer, uh, information, and generating a robust and strong economy. So we do think our our solution does have some base based on the SADEX strategies within its document. So basically, we we propose the idea of creating a by SADEX sudden sovereign debt com uh, committee, which would comprise of uh, you know members of, uh, of of finance ministries from various uh, SADEX members. But the key thing here in what we said was pooling economic sovereignty. Uh, like it or not, the, the world may be considered a realist world with no world government, but we do give away some of our economic sovereignty to foreign actors, whether it be World Bank, IMF, uh, foreign investors, we do give some of the sovereignty back. So our idea is by pooling sovereignty together, you increase your collective action. And this can help with renegotiating debt, especially in the case of highly indebted poor countries who don't have as much um, negotiating room especially with members within the Paris Club or non-Paris Club, you can rely on stronger members and their relationship to help determine better uh, uh, debt terms. Even though the Paris Club has five key principles in terms of you know, uh, fair debt uh, um, uh, terms and those kind of things, it's not always a reality. So the idea is of working together as a block. The other important thing we mentioned was uh, inter sadec trade was something ridiculous at $171 million uh, as of last year, which is ridiculous. Uh, we propose that if SADEC countries can increase trade, which is possible due to the African continental free trade, which has identified the South, uh, Southern uh, SADEC, as well as the EAC, and um, I can't think of the last one right now, as the three sort of cornerstones of EFTA, you can increase your, your, your inter-trade, which will help reduce some of your, your debt and your POPs. Uh, we also have said that you know this committee needs to have you know various oversights processes etc cetera, etc cetera. 
Um, and we also are not um, uh, naive to think that this is going to be something simple. We do know there will be challenges. Politically, we are currently living in the rise of the right, as we mentioned in our paper. Lots of nationalistic move movements, uh, not just in Europe, but in our continent. Uh, the us first narrative might challenge this idea. Also economically, wealthier uh, countries in Africa, uh, you know, in SADC, sorry, maybe your South Africa or your Angola might be reluctant to do this. So we, we do know there are challenges to this. So um, yeah, this is basically the idea of us. It's basically pull your sovereignty together um, it's based in the liberal Pax Africana, Pan Africanist thought of working together. Uh, Umesh, I'll give it back to you to find, finish up. Yeah, so now no, no, basically, this is one, one graph that clearly uh, reflects how uh, vulnerable the external sector of SADC countries, because almost every country has a current account deficit, and some countries has current account deficit, which is more than 10%. So it, that clearly indicates that how bad the situation is and how bad the situation going to be in going forward. Uh, Javin, next slide. So this is, uh, this this shows like how uh, there are high technology exports as a percentage of total manufacturing export. This is an indication where these countries have not really developed and largely relying on cheap labor, which is not something that is sustainable, which is going to be an issue in long term, which is going to be a huge issue when these countries are upgraded to a middle income country, uh, and particularly in the light of now issuing a lot of euro bonds uh, to the market. So when it comes to recommendations, uh, there are a few things as you know, now we have already identified, uh, established the fact that we are taking a holistic approach and working together as a block. Now in this block, it is, uh, we try to highlight the fact that not all the countries are same because different countries belongs to different income categories, right? So when we set up targets or when we set up uh, procedures to follow, that has to account which income category these countries belongs to because their macroeconomic problems are different one to another. Right, so that that is a factor that we establish very clearly, and also uh, we establish the fact that debt to GDP ratio is should not be the indicator. I repeat, it should not be the indicator to determine debt debt sustainability because it's a more complex issue. It needs a more comprehensive series of of indicators to look at and uh, give targets based on those indicators, not merely relying on debt to GDP ratio. Now, this all will happen within the block and within the block identifying which country belongs to which category. And in long term, we, we suggest to, uh, to sort of con, uh, uh, build a comprehensive debt index, which reflects the debt situation in SADC. And then we uh, propose to actually this uh, to sort of stay away from uh, Euro bonds because uh, most countries prematurely had issued Euro bonds. Now, the problem with Euro bonds is like when, when Euro bonds mature, you have to pay all the repayment ones, which is a huge dollar outflow, which is not something that most of these countries can bear. And um, lastly, so this comes down to the trade, how to increase intra-regional trade and thereby increase the dollar inflow so you can actually manage the external sector sustainability because this issue, this debt issue will inevitably will lead to a huge external sector crisis, which we need to prevent uh, before, before it escalates. And that, that is why in short term, we suggest something like currency swap agreements and a regional fund to assess, assist countries to manage the debt service. And this is something that South Asia has done, uh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and certain other countries together where they give uh, currency swap agreements to manage the foreign debt in short term. So yeah, so I'll, I'll conclude at that. So we'll answer other questions uh, during the Q&A round. Great, thank you, Jobin and Umesh. Um, that's an interesting idea. Um, and thank you also for staying within the time, um, which brings us to our, our third speaker, Muriuki Muriungi on legal options. Um, Muriuki, the floor is yours.
Uh, Muruka, you might still be on mute. Sorry for that. Um, thank you very much, Dan, and um, thank you all participants. I hope you can see my screen. Um, um, my paper is looking at the legal options um, or approaches that we could use in trying to restructure or to manage, mostly to restructure sovereign debt in the SADC region. And this is a realization of now that we're in a debt crisis, something has to happen, something has to give. And what it is that we are saying us to give is that we have to restructure a debt. That's what happens whenever we get into a problem, whenever there's a huge debt crisis that then needs to be resolved. And um, just by way of, uh, of uh, uh, background is that the pandemic only exacerbated what was already a very worrying debt situation. So before even COVID, before this year, um, that there was a, a rising a sovereign debt crisis in the whole of the African continent, and particularly in the SADC region. And uh, of course, some studies showing up to $21 billion uh, being spent in external debt repayments, external debt only, forget about domestic uh, debt repayments. And this obviously has been compromising the ability of countries to uh, provide what we call essential public goods. Now, the pandemic has brought on many other things, including a global recession, um, commodity prices falling, uh, declining exports, um, a lot of money that has to be spent on social infrastructure like health. A lot of uh, the tax base has been uh, as withered because, because of this again, and all this has really added to the public debt burden. Now, there are also some very, um, uh, a little bit unique um, features with this debt crisis, unlike the past debt crisis, like the Latin America or the African one, in the earlier decades, whether you're talking about the 1980s or the 1990s. And one of the very unique things is that there's now a very more diverse, uh, vastly diversified creditor community. So you, you're talking about multilateral creditors, private creditors, board holders, or because a number of countries have also tapped sovereign bonds and many other things. And this uh, new uh, vast, uh, bigger typology of creditors it is not easy to restructure as opposed to if they were just similar type of or class of creditors. So you've got, uh, they don't have very good communication channels or links between themselves. And then because of the pandemic and the fact that it's a global issue, it means the crisis is systemic. It's not localized the way you would say before, it's a Latin America debt crisis, it's a African debt crisis. Every country is affected, even though uh, in varying levels. And obviously we know there's no virtual global debt restructuring framework, which is why even we are engaged in this particular discussion on uh, debt restructuring. So um, we, we begin from the premise that debt restructuring is very, very critical uh, in helping SADC countries to deal with the pandemic, just like any other countries within the African region. And so the question, of the paper, the research question was focused on what are the legal options that are available to SADC countries as debtors in restructuring the debt that they have already incurred. Of course, some of the options that I'm going to discuss, some of them are not, um, um, there's something that is already happening or has happened in other areas, but of course, some of the other options are a little bit um, controversial and that's, um, there is the controversy or the discussion that would want us to engage in. And the first one, we are looking at this specifically in light of the pandemic. And so the first thing that we talk about is um, certain countries can invoke uh, the, 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 the legal doctrine of force majeure, which basically would say that this is something that was unforeseeable. And even if uh, the pandemic was foreseeable, the extent to which it caused a collapse of very many things was unforeseeable. Because currently, if we look at it, um, some of the lockdowns, the closure of borders, and many other things, restrictions that have been put in by countries. And uh, the study we did recently, which shows the whole globe on the various actions that it took, they were very extensive to the effect, uh, to the, uh, they're actually almost comparable to what was happening during the first world war. And so the second world war. And that what, what that means is that many economies have actually suffered. So those consequences could be argued that they were unforeseeable therefore um, uh, qualifying as force majeure and the effect of uh, invoking the force majeure clause in any contract is basically to escape the consequences um, that uh, um, would arise in the event of a breach of a contract. 
The other uh, doctrine is what we call state of necessity that also data countries in the SADC region could actually uh, focus on. And uh, this one is basically, it's a rule in international custom, it's a rule that has reached the level of what we call international customary law. And it enables sovereigns or countries to escape again their responsibilities, so long as they can show that there are circumstances that have a reason that are so grave, so imminent, that they threaten the national or economic interests of a nation. And there's a good case that was decided by the exit tribunal. Uh, involving uh, a gas distribution company called LG&E against Argentina. And uh, in the 1990s, you know, Argentina is one of the countries that has had the largest and very persistent debt crisis uh, in the world. And um, so they had uh, provided that they would pay in US dollars some tariffs, and then because of the economic crisis, obviously they changed that. And so this uh, these investors actually sued uh, Argentina at the exit tribunal. Uh, saying so many things. And Argentina was putting forward this state of necessity doctrine as a defense, saying that you know, the economic foundation of the country had been under siege such that they needed to invoke that state of necessity. Of course, um, uh, the exit tribunal importantly said that when the economic foundation of a country is threatened, then that can count as state of necessity. It is not only military invasion or war that counts in order for the doctrine to be invoked. And therefore, that then already sort of provides uh, a justification actually to be invoked in light of this pandemic and the associated economic um, consequences or economic collapse. Um, the next one is the debt standstill. And maybe I didn't, I did not say very much about this uh, or debt moratoriums because I think we had a presentation, uh, I think by Martin Kessler when he was talking about the DSSI, that is the Debt Service Suspension Initiative of the World Bank. But of course, we know very well the limitations of that. And then Kessler uh, mentioned a bit of that, but we know very well that it does not cover very many countries. It, it doesn't cover middle income countries. Um, it only covers a very little percentage of the debt that has already been contracted. And therefore, um, we need one that is more comprehensive, more broad based. And again, debt standstill by their nature are transient in nature. So they only help to resolve the debts in the medium term. It doesn't restructure debt, rather it just enables a country to reallocate funds and therefore it's a temporary measure. Uh, the, next debt, uh, the next option is debt tax. And this one happens even for corporates or companies. Companies engage in debt buybacks every time, especially if they want to prop up their share price or if they do not want to, you know, if they think their share price is either um, uh, downgrade or whether it's being uh, underrated or for whatever other reason. So countries, including sovereigns, I mean, sorry, sovereigns, including the Saudi countries can actually decide to repurchase their own debt in the secondary market where it is trading. And therefore that would then mean they can buy it at a discount or even at the face value. And by doing that, then they'll be able to reduce uh, their debt burden and therefore be able to obtain some temporary relief. And uh, countries like Bolivia actually did that some years ago. They were able to purchase up to $302 million of their debt for at just $40 million. But of course, in order for countries to be able to do those debt buybacks, um, they would need money in the first place to buy that. And therefore, that's where maybe the international committee would need uh, to come through in order to provide those funds to buy back the debt. And um, maybe this could be done through the auspices of the IMF because it has the technical capacity and it could buy back those debts on their behalf. The other doctrine that could be applied, which is now a little controversial, is the odious debts doctrine, which has also been a rule that has been emerging in international in, in, in public international law. And it basically empowers a sovereign uh, to sever either the whole of the debt or part of the debt so that it ceases to comply with the obligations that arise so long as the debt is actually being contracted by what we might call an illegitimate regime or what is called an odious regime. And of course, uh, this is a discussion that has been arising. Of course, much of this odious debt doctrine being traced back to Alexander Sack from Russia and of course, a lot of controversy around there, some saying that actually it didn't mean exactly that, but it's something that has been growing and, and getting some fuel um, 
to the idea that if a debt is contracted uh, by leaders who do not spend that money in the interests of the country, then the citizenry of that country must not be forced to actually repay what did not benefit them. Because obviously we know uh, and some, sometimes creditors and uh, leaders of a country can actually collude even to, you know, buy, uh, I mean, uh, contract debt that does not benefit uh, the citizenry. And so it raises even global justice issues and, and, and equity issues. And although they didn't apply strictly the odious debt doctrine, Mexico and the United States of America have repudiated, have refused to pay debts in the past, arguing that they have been contracted by an illegitimate um, regime. Those were mainly the legal options that could uh, be resolved. But of course, we have others which are already in force, which like collective action clauses, and these are clauses that are usually put in a contract. Uh, there are contractual provisions that operate in the very same way that uh, schemes of arrangement operate under company law. And this is whereby, so long as the majority of creditors, usually three quarters of the creditors or 75% of creditors agree that we are going to take a haircut, that is we are going to take, um, you know, to, to, to agree to, to not be repaid the whole amount, that's what has meant my haircut, then it binds every other creditor. And this then helps to avoid issues of uh, some creditors holding out, what we call hold out creditors. And we know this has happened before, especially with Congo, and I think with Zambia, where some creditors hold out, famously known as the vulture funds. But of course, the limitation of collective action clauses is that it is not all contracts that already have embedded those provisions. The contracts that have been signed uh, for contracting debts by some other countries, it's not all of them that contain that. And the last legal option is really on uh, what we might call a state contingent debt contract. And like the word says, contingent means something depending on what happens in future. So uh, a, state, a state contingent debt contract is a contract that says the sovereign will only pay what it is able to pay uh, in future because of whatever circumstances that may arise. And this is a recognition of the fact that um, a sovereign might not be able to repay or to meet its debt obligations as and when they arise in future because something might happen, like the pandemic happened. Not many could say they had the foresight that a pandemic would happen in the year 2020 and seriously jeopardize a country's fortunes and ability to repay debts. And so you've got even what we call GDP linked bonds, which are bonds that are, are paid, the extent to which they are repaid depends on how the, on the GDP of a country. So, of course, this, the difficulties with crafting a state contingent debt contract is it is difficult to anticipate the future states of the world. But that is why even those contracts are there in the first place, because life is uncertain. The economic conditions are uncertain. But then what can happen is that uh, those contracts can provide for particular instances on, and, 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 and what might happen, and then provide in the event this happens, then this will happen. It can also be beneficial to, borrow, uh, to creditors because it means if the situation that is anticipated does not occur, then they also uh, uh, get to benefit. So those are the various legal options that are available in the interim, in the, uh, in, in the interim and in the immediate period and as of now, unless and until we get what has already been called the missing link in the international financial architecture, which is basically a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. That is obviously needed, but of course, how fast it will come, we do not know because it depends on the goodwill of all countries. And there has been a lot of back and forth for, for, for quite some time, but those are some of the options that can actually be employed by countries in the interim. So ultimately we will need such a mechanism, but until then, these are some of the legal options that the Saudi countries could um, opt uh, for in order to reduce their debt burden, be able to deal with the pandemic and grow their economies. Thank you. Uh, we'll receive now a question. Thanks. Thank you, Morioki. Um, I think ending by saying Aluta Continua is a good summary of the whole debt discussion. Uh, uh, I, I want to remind everyone to uh, please use the chat function if you have questions. Um, or if you want to make comments on any of the papers. Um, and talking of comments, we're going to go to our three commentators now. Uh, I'm going to begin with Dr. Celine Tan. So Celine, uh, the floor is yours.
Thank you, Danny. Um, thank you all um, for these really interesting um, papers. Um, so I've, I've been given the privilege of uh, reading the papers in advance um, and uh, I just thought it, um, I would just give a kind of like a, 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 an initial um, comment which kind of draws in the threads of the three papers, but also um, bringing in some of the uh, discussions that we had last uh, yesterday as well, which is quite interesting. Um, and then I've got some uh, specific questions and comments to the three paper presenters. I hope that's, um, that's an okay way to proceed. Um, so I, I just, it was really interesting because I think when we're talking about sovereign debt um, and sovereign financing, we just need to think about two categories. And I think it's really um, uh, great that the three, all three papers actually deal with the two kind of like the ex ante and the ex post aspects of sovereign financing and sovereign debt. And I think, you know, to thinking about those two things in uh, two, these two categories, I think would be really helpful in terms of structuring um, uh, proposals going forward. I think be quite helpful just uh, um, for us to think about it in that way um, you know being being a lecturer myself I kind of try and try and you know split those things in in, in, in um, into categories that, that sort of people can understand I guess um, and and I think the first aspect of it is really the ex ante you know the contracting of of sovereign financing the terms in which you know financing is extended and, and all three papers kind of deal with that in in a in, in in different ways um the contracts the provisions of the contracts the terms of the contracts and i think the solutions are also also come from how do you reform this ex ante um sovereign uh financing uh, uh framework in terms of whether you have a contractual approach to it designing contracts around you know inclusion of collective action clauses um designing a state contingent um, uh, debt contract, uh, which is what Marugi um, just uh, um, uh, outlined, um, but also, um, you know, designing the legal framework for the contracting um, of the sovereign um, financing. And these goes into kind of the, the, the more sort of public administrative law aspects, I suppose, in terms of transparency, um, in terms of parliamentary scrutiny over debt contracts that are being contracted by the executive on behalf of people um, and the necessary parliamentary approvals. Because again, that goes to also some of the issues about how we, you know, get out of debt contracts or contracts that have been negotiated, um, you know, illegitimately or illegally by governments, right? And this is your kind of odious debt doctrine and um, and issues like that. So issues of due diligence. And I think those those areas I think need to be reformed. So this is kind of goes to the heart of what are the terms and the processes for contracting sovereign debt. And I think all three papers kind of deal with that. Um, and the ex post as expert, um, uh, aspects of, of that would be what happens obviously when those contractual obligations can no longer be honored, no longer be met because of um, either unprecedented, uh, unprecedented circumstances or even circumstances that have come about because the you know the the, the earlier conditions um, were or, or the earlier contracts were were kind of like entered into in in, in dubious circumstances and sustainability of of you know the capacity of the country to absorb that debt but were contracted to anyway regardless. And so the ex post aspect, I think, also um, really important, the lack of the sovereign uh, debt restructuring mechanisms, um, issues of cancellation, mechanisms for renegotiation of those debt contracts, escape from certain contractual obligations, and also, you know, the terms for those debt relief. And I, I, I found that, um, that one gap that I found in the three papers that weren't necessarily addressed in, in, in that way, um, I, I didn't see them coming out in those three papers, was um, this kind of financing of this you know gap because obviously there is a gap um a financing gap that will be left when um you know countries are exposed to not no longer paying that debt re um uh, no, no longer repaying debt but then what happens to where that country then gets or indebted country then gets financing because you still need financing. And I think these were the issues that were raised yesterday um, in terms of our discussion about um, debt swaps. I think Barry Herman um, raised a very important point um, towards the end of the session yesterday about you know, the fact that you know, when you have uh, proposals for climate debt swaps, for example, where's the additionality coming from? And I think one of the, the, the crucial things to remember about the debt relief proposals we've seen so far is that a lot of debt relief Relief is being funded by aid money, right? Rather than actually talking about a actual renegotiation of the terms of the contracts, which were uh, required write downs and um, 
in on a day where the UK Parliament, the UK Treasury um, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer has just said that it's uh, the UK this year will not meet its 0 0.7 um, target um, of GNI uh, for aid, um, then you have a problem because you're not getting the money isn't around to be able to meet these uh, current debt relief um, uh, initiatives. So we, we have a problem uh, with that. And I think related to all these, I think all these these two issues is um, also related to how um, I suppose the debt restructuring and debt sovereign debt financing is embedded within aspects of international economic law, such as investment law, which is what um, uh, Rosilian uh, pointed out so eloquently in his paper um, on, on how those um, sort of challenges, it demonstrates that it's crucial that we need to have a conversation about debt, not in isolation of the other international economic um, um, frameworks that uh, countries are embedded in, you know, trade investment regimes are fundamental also and provide those constraints in which uh, the room for manoeuvre in uh, sovereign debt um, negotiations is, is much uh, con more constrained. So those are kind of my, I suppose, my overarching thoughts on the three papers and where I saw some of the gaps um, uh, uh, emerging. Um, I've got specific questions for all three um, authors, if that's okay. Um, uh, and I'll run through them quite quickly. I think for Rosalia, I think it's really interesting. I just have one question about your paper, actually. So at the start, you kind of talk about, you know, the SADC um, uh, model treaty, um, ex you know, the, the suggestion that bonds would be excluded from the definition of investment. And so my question would be like, you know, if we excluded that within the covered investments and the protected investments under that uh, treaty, will then your discussions about the other things, you know, the, the, the different standards of treatment, you know, elimination of fair and equitable treatment standards from, from, from the model treaty, will it, you know, matter so much because those, you know, sovereign bonds will not be covered by though, uh, you know, by that treaty anyway. So that, that would be my kind of, um, and, and what do you, you know, what, what would be your view on the existing um, bits that are, that do cover uh, these uh, areas? Um, so that would be my question to you. My, my question to um, Umesh and, and, uh, and Jervin, I think, um, I think it's really interesting um, to get a political economy um, take on sovereign debt, because I think that's one thing that lawyers often um, kind of um, forget about um, and, and don't kind of contextualize that in, in that sense. And the kind of like, um, I like the, um, the the kind of metaphor that you use that, you know, if you pull kind of a string, you know, the, the everything just, you know, it's like a house of cards that collapse. You take one card out and it kind of collapses. Um, so my question really is about this committee and uh, is really a legal question in, in some ways. Um, what authority um, would this committee have in terms of negotiating contracts? Because obviously the contracts will be signed by states individually and it's quite different um, you imagining the role of this committee vis-a-vis -vis, you know the Paris club because obviously the Paris club is a club of creditors and therefore it's a creditor I suppose cartel in a way you know where the creditors negotiate on block but the debtors don't um, and is it your feeling that this committee would act as the reverse of that where it would be a debtor cartel where the debtors come together and negotiate a common framework for the creditors um, and and do you have any um, uh, proposal for it to also become sort of in a way like an arbitral tribunal for sovereign debt for the SADC region so uh, that would be my question to you and to Marugi I think you know it's really um, interesting suggestions and really great to go through all the different options and I'd be interested to know from you um, which proposals that you've put forward would be the most effective and politically and economically feasible for the SADC countries? Because um, obviously you had a shopping list of different types of proposals, which kind of covered the ex-ante and ex-post aspect of sovereign financing um, and sovereign debt. Um, my question would be, in your view, what would be the most expedient, most feasible one to implement both in the short term and the long term? Um, and I think I'm going to leave that, <laughs> my comments there, but that's okay, Danny. Great. Thanks very much, Celine. That was great. Um, I'm going to, we, we'll come back to each of the presenters to answer your questions at the end. Um, but let me switch now to Professor Mbengu um, for the second round of comments. So, Makani, okay. over to you. 
Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Good uh, afternoon to everybody, and many thanks to Daniel and uh, Magali for for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to to have the opportunity to intervene in this uh, very nice uh, workshop on sovereign debt management and rene renegotiation uh, in Africa. Uh, maybe many of you are aware that at the very beginning. Uh, of the pandemic, uh, Macky Sall, the president of Senegal, has published uh, an article uh, in the Financial Times uh, about Africa and COVID-19. And uh, in, in this article, Macky Sall was calling uh, basically for a new world order, a new world order that would require uh, mutual trust and sincere willingness to cooperate on issues of common interest and shared values while respecting the differences and diversities of, um, of, of nations. And one of the pillars of the new world order that Macky Sall was calling for in this article uh, is of course uh, the need to cancel Africa's public debt and the need to restructure uh, the private debt of African countries on the basis of agreed mechanisms. I'm referring to, uh, to, to, to this article from uh, Macky Sall, just to say that um, this workshop is very timely. This workshop is very timely. It is a workshop that is also very important for the entire African continent, even if the workshop is mostly focusing on a SADC perspective, I am very convinced that uh, most of the papers uh, that are being um, uh, developed in the context of the of the of the plan book will be very very useful, very relevant uh, to all the co the countries um, in Africa. So I I I I enjoyed uh, reading the three papers uh, of this uh, of this session. I found them very insightful, uh, very well researched, and also so provocative. Uh, in, in many uh, aspects. So what I would like to do now is to share comments. Uh, comments I believe could improve uh, the, the, the papers and allow me to say that I will just focus on, on two papers because I'm, I'm not a big specialist of how to renegotiate sovereign debt as a block. So I will uh, focus my comments um, uh, only on uh, Roselian's paper and uh, Muricu's. Uh, papers. So when I when I read those uh, those two papers, I I found that there were some major common um, uh, issues that were characterizing them. So before I go into my specific remarks, I would like to emphasize some of the common issues I found in the two uh, papers. Common problems. Uh, the first problem I identified. Uh, is with respect to the titles, the titles of the of the of the papers. I think that the titles that have been chosen by both Roselian and uh, uh, sorry, Muriki, do not really reflect uh, the, the 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 depths of what they are developing. So, for instance, if I come to uh, uh, Rosalian you have decided to um, entitle your paper Sovereign Debt in the SADC Model Bit. I, I, I have to say that I don't believe that your paper is just limited to the SADC Model Bit. I find it a pity that your title is just mentioning the, 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 the SADC Model Bit when in reality, your paper is much more ambitious uh, than, than that. You are actually looking at uh, the broad spectrum of international investment agreements that are applicable in the SADC region. And of course, this could be the SADC, SADC model bit, but you are also mentioning bits as such, bilateral investment treaties. You are also mentioning some other investment agreements that are not bits. If you take, for instance, you know, investment agreements that have been concluded between Brazil and some of the SADC member states, these are not bilateral investment treaties. Brazil is a country that has you know, distantiated itself from the bilateral investment treaty track. So even if those agreements that Brazil has concluded with some of the SADC countries are bilateral, 
they are not called officially bilateral investment treaties. And if you check the website of UNTAD, you will see that those agreements are not classified under the, the traditional box of bilateral uh, in investment treaties. So I've been wondering whether you know, it wouldn't be more relevant for your paper, Rosalian, to be maybe entitled uh, legal issues arising out of sovereign debt under international investment agreements uh, concluded uh, in the SADC region, for instance, in the SADC region or with SADC countries. But I, I believe that your title right now is not uh, very adapted. I have the same, of course, uh, as I said, concern respecting, uh, in respect to the title uh, that uh, Muriuku uh, has, uh, has, has chosen. Uh, legal options and approaches of managing and restructuring sovereign debt in the SADC region. I, I think, in my view, this is not really, you know, relevant as a title. First, I don't really see what is the distinction between options and approaches. I think these are synonymous uh, concepts. I'm wondering whether you should not think about um, entitling your paper managing and restructuring sovereign debt in the SADC region in the context of COVID-19, because this is also something else that is missing, I believe, uh, Moriku in your, in your paper, is that you are focusing on the COVID-19 pandemic and, 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 and how it could be, uh, it could influence or impact, you know, the, the, the restructuring of, of sovereign debt, and this does not appear in the title of, of your paper. So I would suggest to do something like managing and restructuring sovereign debt in the SADC region in the context of, 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 of COVID-19. So this is the first problem, I common problem I, I identified. The second common problem I identified in the two papers is with respect to the structure, is with respect to the structure. I have to say that there are many very great ideas in the two papers as I have indicated, but uh, we get a bit lost with the, with the structure. I think it would be very important that both of you try to have conceptual titles in order to better organize your, 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 your reasoning. Uh, if I take, for instance, the example of Moriyuki's paper, uh, you are just listing options. But I think maybe one approach would be if you get rid of the title, uh, that uh, that I've suggested uh, that that you that you have, you could have a part dealing with options, subpart like uh, in your paper, and then another part dealing with defenses, defenses under international law. You know regarding um, what states could invoke uh, in relation to their debt and 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 COVID nineteen. Because when you talk about uh, force majeure, when you talk about um, uh, state of necessity, you are talking about defenses that can be invoked by states under international law when it comes to, uh, to, to pandemic. So I would suggest to, 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 to restructure, and of course, I don't want to go into the details, and I would be very happy to have bilateral discussions, but there's, there, there, there's really um, a, a problem at that level. A third major, major common issue I've identified in the two papers is a lack of reference to African uh, scholarship. You know, uh, don't get me wrong. I, I teach in a, in a Swiss university, I'm in, I'm in Europe and I really don't have any problem with, with you know, referring to colleagues from Europe or from the US or whatever when I'm doing research. But I think that it's a pity when, when we as Africans, we do research, we engage into scholarship and we do not refer to what has been written. By, by Africans. If I take, for instance, your paper, Rosalian, you mention a lot Michael Weibel and, 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 and those very nice friends and colleagues of, of, of ours, but there is, there is a lot of literature, at least for the last 10 years, there's a lot of literature regarding you know, investment agreements in Africa, regarding the issue of sovereign debt in, 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 in Africa that is not appearing at all uh, in, in, in both of, 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 this, of these papers. Uh, if you take the Journal of World Investment and Trade of 2017, I have edited with Stefan Schill a special issue on Africa and the investment regime. If you take the very, the, the first issue of 2020 of the ICSID review, you have an entire special issue on Africa 
and, and, and the exit system. And I'm not talking about all the articles written by James Gatti, uh, written by uh, Juan Kidan, et cetera, et cetera. And I would be very happy to help both of you if you, if you want to have access to that literature. Uh, but I think it's important when we talk about Africa to have literature written also by Africans on how they see things on, on Africa, because at the end of the day, we are most of the time those who are more aware of what's going on, on on the continent. The last comment I wanted to make in relation to what I call the common issues is with respect to recent uh, developments that might be relevant for both of your, of your papers. And that one I know is not very public, but very recently the African Union uh, has adopted a draft declaration on the risk of ISDS um, for COVID related measures. It was a few days ago, the ministers of trade have, have adopted that declaration. It is not yet public. I think it will be public starting from 5th December, but I'm very happy to share it with you in advance if, if you want. I think it's very interesting because it's a declaration that is emphasizing the, the risks that our countries are facing in a context of COVID-19, but also in particular in relation to, um, to ISDS. And, 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 and I know that both of you implicitly or explicitly, you are actually uh, dealing with ISDS because you are showing what defenses can be invoked. Uh, Rosalia, you are talking a lot about the risk of investor state dispute settlement and the in international investment uh, agreements. And of course, measures that our countries might take with respect to sovereign debt these days in the context of pandemic might be actually challenged uh, before, before investment tribunals. So the question is, how, how do we deal with it? How do we make sure that countries in such a context of vulnerability can also you know, protect themselves from the risk of, 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 of ISDS? And this is what this declaration is addressing, but also the African Development Bank already in May has been you know, ringing the, the bell on the need to think about ways to protect our countries uh, against you know, the risk of, of, of ISDS. And I think that both of you should maybe include that. So this was my, my comment, what I would call my common uh, comments. Now, quickly to come just on few specific comments regarding each of the, of the paper, I will start quickly with Muriki. Muriki, I would be very interested in knowing you know, what is your approach to debt to debt contracts? Because when we read your paper, you, you talk about debt contracts and you connect force majeure only with debt contracts. And I was a bit puzzled by that because force majeure is also a defense under customary international law. The only defense you invoke under customary international law in your paper is the defense of necessity, which is Article 25 of the International Law Commission articles on state responsibility. But you, when you talk about force majeure, you don't mention it as a defense and the customary international law, you just connect it only to debt contracts. So I would like to understand you know, what is, and I think this is something that might have to be better explained in the, in the paper. You know, what are debt contracts and how debt contracts could actually lead you know, to, to breach of international obligations, because it's not only breach of contracts, they could also lead to breach of international uh, obligations. And I would be interested to, to know a bit more about, you know, what do you mean by debt contracts? Can they be investment contracts, for instance? And why do you just limit force majeure to the, to the issue um, of, 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 of contracts? Uh, then uh, another specific aspect uh, I, I think uh, I would like to, to hear your, your, your view on uh, is, you know, uh, the, uh, with respect to the issue of, of, state, uh, of, of uh, state of necessity. You know that under customer international law, a state cannot invoke the defense of necessity if it has itself contributed to, to that state of necessity. And this is something that is not really developed in your paper. You know, can we consider that African countries, or at least SADC countries, can we consider that they have not contributed themselves at all to the, to the, to the current pandemic? You, you might think that they have not at all contributed to it, but you need to take a clear position on that. Because the, most of the time, the doctrine of necessity 
when states invoke it, they fail to win on that doctrine or on that, on that defense because many international courts and tribunals would say that they have contributed themselves also to the, to the occurrence or the emergence of the so-called uh, state of, of, of necessity. So I would like to hear you on those aspects. And Rosalia, and last but not least, uh, from a more specific angle, I, I, I think once again, and it is in line with what I was saying that your paper should not be limited to the SADC model bit. In the SADC region, there is a SADC protocol on finance and investment since 2006, which was actually six years before the 2012 SADEL, SADEC model bid. So I'm, I'm not sure why the SADEC protocol on finance and investment is not at all addressed uh, in, your, in your paper. Why don't you find it relevant? In particular, knowing that in 2016, the, the SADEC countries revised Annex 1 to the SADEC protocol on finance and investment to get rid of ISDS. They got rid of ISDS. So I think this is very interesting to, to, to actually address. Uh, the, the SADC protocol and how, you know, it could be relevant in the context of, 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 of sovereign debt. Then you don't make mention to the Pan-African Investment Code. You know, SADC is not isolated. SADC is SADC, but SADC is part of Africa. And a lot of the things that are going in SADC are, are, are also influenced by what is going on at the, at the continental level. And I know that this is not a public document yet, but there is actually a new SADC model bit, and I would be very happy to share it with you, but the 2012 has been revised in 2017. And in 2017, the new model of SADC bit is actually reflecting the Pan-African Investment Code that was adopted as a model for the African continent in 2016. So I think you would need also to look at SADC developments in terms of investment law in light of the more continental um, uh, development. I was also a bit puzzled that you don't mention some of the national developments that are interesting. South Africa has a new investment law since 2015 that is excluding ISDS, that is, you know, limiting some of the investment standards at the, at the international level. And I'm, I'm wondering why, you know, you wouldn't talk about national developments like that. And you have also from Tanzania, if I understand well, Tanzania has a new law you know, has been adopting new laws that, are, that have an impact on investment. If you think about the 2007 Tanzanian law on, on permanent sovereignty over natural resources, these are very important developments that can actually inform some of the very interesting developments you are making or some of the interesting ideas you are raising in, 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 your, in, your, in your paper. And then last but not least, I think that I would be very interested uh, to see in all the papers. I haven't listened to the previous discussion, but at least, you know, today, I, I would be very interested to, 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 to see what can be the lessons. What can be the lessons for African integration? What can we draw as lessons from, from what you guys are, are, are suggesting? You know that we are now in the process of the of, of implementing our the, 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 the AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area. We are going soon to start negotiating the investment protocol to the AFCFTA. So what, what can we do? Can we, can we use this momentum to actually think about new provisions in, in, in our regional tr free trade agreements or in our future continental investment protocol, new provisions dealing with the issue of, of sovereign debt, not just excluding debt securities and so on from the definition of investment, but what can we think about? And I think that we should take advantage of this great book project, of this great workshop to also, you know, think about the future. What can we learn from all these great uh, developments you are making and how African countries can better protect themselves in the future you know, based on, 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 on this idea. So this is what I wanted to, to share, but once again, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to, 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 the, to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Makani. And thank you for, for your generous offers to, to talk uh, and assist bilaterally and to share that information. Some of the documents you mentioned, I think would be in, interesting to all the authors of all the papers and, 
uh, if you send them to us, we'll be happy to share them. Um, and just before handing over to Kenneth, I just want to underline your point about the importance of including other African writings in the, in the, in the references and not just rely on sort of the usual suspects uh, in writing in, in, in the, the articles. Um, before, but I think you've given everyone lots to think about. And before they respond, I want to give Kenneth Mwenda an opportunity to, to give his comments as well. So Kenneth, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Danny. Um, trying to turn on my camera here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, thank you so much, Danny and uh, Magali for organizing this um, uh, a great conference here. Uh, I know we are living in a uh, digital world now given COVID-19 situation, so we kind of have to adapt all of us to uh, the, the new normal working virtually. Uh, and also I want to acknowledge, uh, first of all, the good papers from all the three presenters and uh, my colleagues, uh, Celine and uh, Makane, the two commentators, they gave uh, excellent um, feedback on the papers, which I hope that the presenters will take into account. Uh, now I'll start with the first paper and my approach really will be to see how we can improve these papers uh, for ultimate publication. Um, so uh, Ros Rosalind, I think um, that, that was a good paper that you presented there. Um, perhaps you may want to consider, um, again, this is more of a conceptual uh, issue. When you're looking at publication of a paper as a book chapter, possibly, it's, it's pretty helpful to sort of underlie what the main argument of your paper is. It's, it's a bit hard to, to really get a handle on what the argument is. You've outlined various segments of the paper, that's fine, but what is your argument? Uh, apart from saying that you know, sovereign bonds, for example, are not covered under the model law, but you know, what is the main thesis of, of, of your paper? So that can be laid out right up front with a little roadmap. This paper argues that da 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 da, you know, the first part of the paper will address ABCD. It gives a much more conceptual flow of, of your argument from the very beginning. Uh, so that can really improve the paper if you're moving towards uh, publication. Now, I want to tie into the point that my colleague Makane made there uh, on the importance of comparative studies. Uh, that, you know, uh, SADIC is not an isolated region. If you can pick up lessons of experience, best practices from other regions, including Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, uh, on, you know, the debt restructuring, how they've handled it. South America, those type of arguments, for example, the ECLA uh, School of Thought and all those guys, it could enrich your paper, okay? Uh, so don't look at SADIC as an isolated region. And within SADIC, we have some competitive inequalities. There's SADIC and there's COMESA. So there, there are those dynamics uh, that we have to deal with. Uh, so it's pretty important. Uh, you spoke uh, a lot on harmonization of laws and you know the various countries and so forth, which, which was brilliant. Uh, but try to enhance that argument with some comparatives. Uh, comparative studies usually try, give a much more holistic approach to issues. Uh, it gives a sense to the reader, to your audience, that you have a mastery of, of your you know, uh, or subject area, uh, rather than a very sort of narrow parochial uh, approach. So that's on uh, the face paper, but otherwise, congratulations on a good job. Uh, my colleagues, Jeva Naidu, um, Political economy, I wear two hearts as a lawyer and uh, it's sort of in your field as well. So that was very interesting. Um, good paper there, good argument. SADIC should move as a block. But I have some questions you may want to address probably to improve the paper. One of the arguments is that if we were to move towards this idea of, you know, SADIC sort of dealing with debt restructuring at a, at a sub region level, we clearly don't have an international framework that governs, uh, you know, debt restructuring or management issues uh, from a legal standpoint. We don't have that uh, in the international community. And it would require ideally a supranational institution uh, at the supranational level that's within the region to have that type of thing. And there are a number of issues now from an economic, you guys are economics, political economists, issues like the question of single you know, monetary policy uh, or single currency, for example, 
to be able to move that agenda uh, forward. Uh, different currencies in the regions, for example, have militated against regional integration, and you know that very well. If you take Francophone Africa, for example, they've been able to handle that because of the CFA front. So they're able to maneuver the, the regional central bank. They're able to deal with those issues much more effectively than where you have a dispersed heterogeneous sort of uh, environment. So I think that's pretty important that you factor in that, especially from the political economy point of view. Uh, you also have, you know, fisc from the fiscal policy side of, of things, uh, competitive inequalities for taxes, different tax incentives. We have not harmonized those things. So the collective effort becomes pretty much a challenge if you don't have harmonized monetary and fiscal policies. So those are some of the issues to, to factor in. Turning to the third paper, uh, Moriuki, uh, good work there. Um, like my point, uh, Makane pointed out, I, he made a very good observation, which I, I was going to do, but he sort of preempted me, but I'm, I'll touch on it. The state of necessity doctrine. The, the application of that doctrine is usually premised on the fact that the state that's making that claim has not contributed to the default. But if you've contributed to the default, you can't invoke that. You know, it's more like contributory negligence. You contributed to the mess. So, you know, the courts of law may not hold your argument uh, as sustainable. So they might throw it out. So I think you need to clarify that very well. If your view is indeed that these countries who are invoking the state of necessity doctrines have not contributed, make it so clearly and back it up with evidence and footnotes. Uh, otherwise, you know, just throwing it out there, you know, is not very helpful. And again, similar to uh, the comment on Roslyn, you've explained what the paper deals with. But what is missing from your paper is the main argument. What's the thesis of your paper? I think make that very clear. We know that you are writing about legal options for debt for you know, debt restructuring, but what is your main argument? What is the key argument? I think that should come out clearly from the very beginning. And, you know, the introduction is very, very important. And if you're gonna write abstracts, each one of you, if you're gonna write abstracts for your paper, those abstracts should be very clear as to what the argument is and what you will cover. Uh, so that's very important. Um, the other issue you touched on was on odious uh, dates. Uh, odious dates is a very interesting concept. Uh, there's a lot of controversy as to whether it has fully crystallized into customary international law or not. Uh, of course, the lobbyists, the NGOs, and so forth, they've pushed a lot of arguments. The UN, they've pushed arguments for, you know, saying odious dates are now part of customary international law. Uh, but related to odious dates, there's the issue of vulture funds, you know, and how they come in uh, to come and buy these dates and then, you know, try to claim and so forth. The, the other point that I, I, I noted and uh, my colleague Makane raised very well is, you know, the various sort of arguments you made on um, force majeure and so forth. Uh, there are various techniques uh, that one could use, for example, subrogation, okay, uh, where one creditor, uh, you, know, you know, takes the position of the other in, in, the, in, the, in the distribution of, um, uh, of uh, you know, debts. Uh, so those are some of the mechanisms that you, you, can, you can look at. So look at the issue more thoughtfully. You've, you've got the building blocks, but make a clear argument what you are trying to say. Uh, I think that's very important. I, then most of the other things I won't go into detail because my two colleagues, Celine and Makane, have touched on them. Uh, but I hope that my, my few comments that I've given to give structure to your paper, to help your paper stay in shape, especially if it's gonna to go to publication, you know, it will benefit from peer review. Please take into consideration all the comments that have been given by all of us, the three commentators to really strengthen your papers. Again, I want to congratulate you for brilliant work. Thank you so much, Danny and Magali. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Um, I, I think your comments uh, are very helpful to the to the authors to to help uh, move the papers towards publication, and and that is the goal. Um, I think all three commentators uh, together have we couldn't have planned it better. They, it, so well coordinated to give lots of ideas uh, and help to the to the presenters. I think the presenters should have an opportunity now to respond. And let's do it in the order in which they presented. So start with Roselian, and then we'll go to Jovan and Umesh, and then to Muriuki. So Roselian, over to you. 
Um, first of all, I would like to uh, to thank you, the commentators, on their very very constructive uh, points, uh, and I will include them on my final uh, paper. And but I will also would like to respond to. Uh, to questions which have been posed by the commentators. Uh, start with question posed by Celine. The first uh, was on the, why if we move the scope of definition, we move the scope of definition of investment and why do we have to consider the issue of uh, fair and equitable treatment and the MFN? Because if we move, uh, the definition of sovereign date, date as, uh, as part of uh, investment. Here, the first concern uh, is when you start, for example, with the most favorable national treatment, is the, is the danger of incorporating new terms from other BIT. So even if you adopt the static model BIT, let's say uh, Tanzania uses the static model BIT with, uh, let's say, this UK. So we have, uh, let's say, a German BAT, then uh, the UK can use uh, an MFN principle within the model BAT to incorporate the terms from the German BAT. So that's why I also included the MFN because even if you remove the, the, the definition, there are possibility for tribunals to see from other BAT which you have not yet uh, terminated to bring in uh, those uh, uh, those definitions. Another thing is for the uh, the fair and equitable treatment. Uh, this one I included uh, them because they play part in in sovereignty. They have appeared in different cases as being used uh, when it comes to bond uh, restructuring of state. That's why I included. But I agree with you that. When you remove the definition of sovereign bond within the, uh, the definition of investment, then the scope of uh, the fair and equitable treatment, then it might end there. Um, the other is uh, the other BIT, which they are still, they have the definition which contain uh, sovereign bond as part of BITs. What about them? So the one thing which I uh, say it is, uh, which I overlooked it to mention in my paper, is uh, either a negotiation of the current BIT or having some kind of agreement between the states that uh, just like an annex to the current BIT stating uh, their position with regard to the, uh, to, to, to what sovereign bond should not, uh, should be excluded in the, uh, in the model BAT. So that's what uh, I would like to highlight regarding to those questions. And for Makane, I would love to, to see those documents uh, which you have stated, and I'll reconsider the title of the paper. And once I consider, then you, I see that the issue you have said it becomes more relevant, including not treating uh, the static as an island in itself, but considering other surrounding circumstances, which have uh, very serious implication on how static uh, members hate to operate. And uh, also uh, what uh, uh, Prof. Kenneth has said, the main argument, I think that I miss of, uh, should underline it at the very uh, beginning, but uh, I guess highlight is that the main argument is sovereign bonds should be excluded from uh, investment because what they, the impact they have, they affect uh, the power of the state to, to make restructuring because if you see other, uh, other investors, they can get the full payment of their bonds, and then you are going to get a hack. Then you see no incentive why you should uh, sit with, this, uh, with the government to restructure your debt while you know that you can use uh, some investment tribunal to get the full payment of what uh, you, you, you owe the state you owes to you. 
So I guess I will consider all those and doing the comparative studies with other uh, with other uh, regions and uh, countries how they dealt with this uh, issue of um, uh, sovereign bonds. Thank you so much, and I will take back to to Daniel to proceed. Thanks, Rosalind. Um, just before I hand over to Jervin and Umesh, uh, just to remind everybody else, if you have questions or you want to ask a question, please use the chat box um, because we'll have a second round of questions and comments after we've heard from the, the three presenters. So Jervin, let me have... Uh, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. So um, I'll take uh, Dr. Celine's question. Uh, first of all, uh, we must say that we are not the legal experts, so uh, we are unable to give like a very technical detailed comment on the questions asked. So what we try to do here is sort of propose this idea of negotiating uh, debt as a block, uh, particularly given the, given the fact that foreign debt is becoming a concern for the region, right? So in that, what we sort of expect from the proposed committee is sort of act as more like an intermediary party, which gives the assurance for the creditors that Sadek region is uh, a safe region for them to lend. Uh, if I uh, give an example for, uh, now this, this comes particularly at the context of uh, they have a lot of foreign debt repayments to pay, particularly in light of the sovereign bond maturities. So we, in our paper, we don't believe that continuous reissuing of sovereign bonds is going to resolve this problem. We believe that this is going to sort of uh, complicate the issue further. So one of the things that we look at is the potential to issue, potential, potential to obtain funds through syndicated loans, which means foreign currency term facility loans. I believe uh, Professor Dr. Selim might be very familiar with this. This is a kind of an instrument that most of the middle income countries now try to use. So this, when we get this instrument as opposed to somewhere in one, we believe that providing an assurance as a block to the creditor would uh, give gives the uh, countries more chance to borrow, right? Because uh, as an alternative to going to international capital markets and borrow through sovereign bonds. So what this uh, committee intends to do in that regard is sort of ensure that these countries, of course, depending on their different income levels, one adhering to certain fiscal discipline. So through that, we hope international lenders, whatever that may be, bilateral or the multilateral lenders, would have some uh, assurance or would have some faith in terms of uh, providing credit because this particular committee will in turn sort of ensure that this money, uh, money is well spent and paid back on time. Right now, now we are not talking about each and foreign, each and every foreign loan needs to go through with the committee. This is something that we have to uh, figure out what exactly the protocol is. But what we are saying is in for certain foreign loans, particularly looking at uh, resolving the BOP crisis in short term, give this option. certain conditions which are specifically aimed at tariff liberalization uh, or uh, austerity, which in which are inevitably hurt the growth. So that as a region is something that is uh, quite adversely affecting, right? So we, we sort of emphasize on the fact that to prevent this, have a common framework through which we monitor. Also, one important point to add is uh, one thing we race here is uh, to avoid export credit. What happens in export credit loans is 
uh, the the creditor gives the loan and sometimes the loan money doesn't necessarily come to the the borrowing country either so we sort of propose to change this mechanism a bit and we believe to change this negotiating as a block would have a better chance for example uh, when chinese exim bank uh, lend money in uh, most cases uh, the contractor itself is Chinese, so there's very little multiple effect for the borrowing country. So, which in turn is something that most of the Saudi countries can't afford, right? So that's the kind of a idea that we are looking at, and I I, I believe we have to take the point that this lacks certain specific le uh, legal technicalities. I, I I hope actually to get further comments from Dr. Selin on this and figure out uh, specific technical, legal technicalities regarding the matter. And the, the second question, I believe Jai will, will take it. Uh, thanks, Ramesh. Uh, thank you again to all the commentators for their feedback. We really do appreciate it. Um, yes, uh, as Ramesh has mentioned, we're not legal experts and we really would appreciate uh, the assistance from uh, uh, Professor Tian, um, and the other other experts on this to guide us in this because we really do think this is possible. Um, I will be taking Professor Kenneth's uh, question, uh, question and points. Thank you, sir. I really do appreciate your comments and feedback. Um, we were looking initially at considering, you know, uh, including a sort of supranational organization in managing uh, sovereign debt, as you uh, suggested, but we were sort of reluctant because the paper was pretty much focused on SADEC, but we did mention the AFTA quite a lot in our paper. And we do believe that, as I mentioned earlier, that this is the sort of building block in which we can achieve our goals that this, this Pax Africa, uh, Africana uh, approach will be able to get us towards negotiating as a, as a block. So uh, we do believe in, I think, in our revised section, and now that you brought it up, we will uh, look into maybe including that the maybe the African Union could play a role as a supranational organization in helping develop this framework going further, not just for SADC, but for, for, for all the different economic unions, which eventually um, link into the African continental free trade, which is, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a milestone for Africa. And, you know, obviously right now it's currently, it's been delayed. It was meant to be implemented already this year, but with COVID, we don't know when it's going to be implemented, even though the scheduled date is for next year. So we'll see about that. So as for the monetary and physical, uh, fiscal policy, there was something we thought about. The problem was we, we were trying to think about how do we sort of find a balance between these different member states? Within SADC, seven of our, of our member states are highly indebted, poor countries. So we were trying to find a sort of like mixed sort of middle ground where we had certain terms uh, for different countries. We were thinking of going on the sort of hard line approach of certain rules, regulations in terms of monetary and fiscal policy in terms of um, securing this uh, negotiating as a block. So that's something we will consider. And so another thing, we're not proposing for a common currency. Uh, that, that's not something we, we're proposing for in our idea, just to uh, comment on that. But uh, thank you very much for that. So we will definitely think about the monetary and fiscal policy. There's something that we were not so sure about and even the supranational um, issue, we, we weren't so 100% sure about it. But uh, thank you for that and we look forward to further questions. Great, thank you, Jovan and Umesh. Um, let me hand over to Murioki. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. I would also want to begin by appreciating the uh, very um, insightful comments from all the reviewers and commentators, uh, Professor Tan, uh, McCann and uh, Kenneth. And um, um, I would wish to um, make a few responses to the, some of the comments and as well as the questions that were posted. But obviously the comments that uh, were issued, um, definitely be sure to incorporate them in the paper, in the next review of the paper. For the first one was um, the initial draft. Um, and we'll begin by the question that was posed by Professor Tan uh, about which proposals among uh, the various uh, options that I, I proposed would be most effective most expedient, economically and politically feasible. 
Um, and I would just state that maybe what might be economically feasible may not necessarily be politically feasible. Uh, and so there may be a distinction there, but obviously the ones that are most economically and politically feasible is what really has been happening at the moment. So here, uh, like talking about the collective action clauses and the exit consents, which are already uh, happening in an ad hoc fashion and which are contained in the debt contracts. Um, I think the one also debt standstills, which is already being spearheaded by the G20 and the World Bank and the others, that is also not very controversial. And I think even debt buybacks would be economically and politically feasible. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the audience debt, the, um, uh, the necessity doctrine, and the others which have the effect of sort of repudiating the debt are much, much more politically uh, uh, unfeasible because uh, obviously, it, it will bring in a clash between the data countries and, and the creditor countries. So those are obviously far much more difficult to um, uh, to implement uh, because obviously you must ensure that you also bring your creditors on board. Uh, but uh, and therefore that's uh, that, that's the most that I would say. Safe to add the point that um, sometimes even what might not look uh, to be uh, might not one might not appear economically feasible in the short term might actually be the most economically feasible in the long term because the essence of debt restructuring is so as to provide relief so as to provide room for economic recovery so that a debtor is able to repay debts in future so if um if uh um, creditors do not offer a debtor any form of debt restructuring or any form of debt relief, then obviously um, it will be because of collective action problem, just like the rest of the courthouse, usually uh, it is likely to lead to, um, you know, everybody really getting nothing. Um, and that will be bad for both, both creditors and the debtors. Um, the moving to comments by Professor McKenna, uh, he talks about the general issues about the title of the paper. Uh, um, and, 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 and this proposal is very good regarding the retitling of the paper uh, about the structure as well, um, uh, having some headings, um, more reference to African scholarship and um, the, the recent development by the AU, those ones I'll be sure to capture and uh, hopefully um, also get in touch for more insights on that. Uh, to his questions, he asked one, what is my approach to debt contracts? Why was the force majeure doctrine? It doesn't appear as if it is included uh, in my discussion. Uh, it, it appears to be limited only to debt contracts. And what do I mean by debt contracts? Uh, I, I, and certainly I do agree with him that force majeure is also applicable in international treaties, uh, which are also contracts in nature, but it is also applicable in international treaties besides private debt contracts. And so I'll be sure to make that clearer so that the force majeure doctrine is applicable both for private debt contracts as well for, as for international treaties. Um, the question raised by both uh, Professor McCann as well as Professor Kenneth uh, Mwenda is about um, the state of necessity, obviously controversial and uh, uh, they're talking about the if countries or if data countries have contributed to uh, the problem that they've gotten into, then they cannot take uh, advantage uh, or they cannot seek refuge under the state of necessity doctrine, which is actually the position. Um, so obviously the question now would be a factual issue really. It would be a factual issue as to whether a country has participated uh, in contributing to its position. If it has, then it cannot you know, uh, sees itself of that remedy. But if it has not, then uh, it can take advantage of that remedy. And uh, uh, that state of necessity doctrine was being discussed within the context of the pandemic. And because it cannot be said that the pandemic is a cause of uh, any country, maybe regarding the measures that have been taken by the countries, because they are the part of the cause of why they are unable to repay, that it might be said is contributory, but some of the measures are actually uh, became necessary because almost every country in the world has taken some measures which have obviously led to some form of economic contracting. Uh, and therefore it is in that context, just like the Argentina situation where there was an economic crisis. So if there's a problem in the macroeconomic, uh, uh, if it's macroeconomic or if it's global, but it affects the economy then, but the point is made, I think the clarity will be made in the next version of the paper to specifically say that um, it is only take, uh, you can only avail yourself of the remedy if a debt country has not participated or has not contributed to the problem. 
Um, I think um, the other uh, question <clears throat> from Professor, I cannot mind, I think talked about uh, the, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've talked about the prof, uh, the point on state of necessity, and uh, maybe to discuss the mechanisms like the subrogation, and I'll be sure to include that as well. Maybe the final point, I think that I missed out by Professor Tan, she has, she had asked about, what about, I think it was a common question directed to all of us. I can't say exactly, I do have the uh, exact response, but she was talking about the financing gap. Once this debt relief is offered to various debtors, then what happens? Um, uh, when, where, where will the money come from? And uh, in terms of why, when the debt relief is given, because most of, uh, of uh, and I would say that sometimes it doesn't really, the gap doesn't have to be filled. And some other times, if depending on the solution that has been offered, um, the restructuring or the relief will enable countries to, uh, to, to rearrange themselves and, and, and attain economic recovery. And therefore, especially if it's a moratorium or a dead standstill or some form of restructuring, which has simply put pushed the repayment forward, then uh, the country will be able to repay in, 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 in the long term. But sometimes really the loss will fall, uh, may have to fall where it may. Um, those I think are, uh, hopefully I've responded to any in case I've missed out the risk. Um, thank you very much, Dan. Great, thank you. Um, I, I want to give open the, to the floor now. Uh, so if there's anyone who has a questions, I know Jim Call Fumarodzi had a question in the chat box, but I think um, uh, uh, Umesh and Jervin have responded to that really in responding to Celine Tan's point on, on the authority of the, the SADC committee. Um, but anybody else, uh, you can either post the question or if you indicate you want to talk, I'll give you the floor. Um, Magali, I know you would like to talk uh, if there's anybody else, um, but Magali, I'll hand over to you for to start and then other people can come in after that. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I do have a few thoughts on these, on these papers, but first I must say uh, thank you to all the authors. These were very thought provoking papers that are dealing with quite complex issues that raise quite a lot of uh, legal, political challenges and questions. Um, and I'd like to say thank you for, um, to the commentators because a lot of the comments that they've made um, quite well articulate some of the thoughts I had when, when we were looking through the papers. So just a few thoughts and ideas. So on paper number one, uh, Rosalian Jackson, um, I do uh, agree with Professor Makami's idea on, on the title. And that was one of the first thoughts when I looked at the title that it didn't adequately reflect the issue that you are um, that you're addressing. Um, I'm also grateful that um, at least two of the commentators brought up the issue of uh, African sources. Um, and it is one of the um, thoughts I had when I was reading, um, reading this paper on, on sovereign debt and bits. And not only was I thinking about African authors, but I was thinking of African examples. Uh, so one clear illustration is yeah, at the very um, early sections of the paper, you mentioned that there are many causes of default. So countries may default for various reasons. And you provide, I believe, three examples uh, that indicate different causes for default. You had mentioned, I guess, Argentina's debt crisis. You mentioned um, uh, the euro crisis uh, 2008. And, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember the third one, but you didn't go on to provide any African examples of why do African countries default or have defaulted on their debts. So those kind of areas provide good, um, um, good opportunities to also provide African examples. So it's not just about the African authors, but about the African examples themselves and we weaving them in. And I guess my main comment on this paper was um, just actually hearing on what is your actual conclusion. So you did quite a, a good technical analysis of bits. And I, I feel that if you add in quite a lot of the suggestions that uh, Prof Makami has, has, um, has given, um, it'll add richness to your paper, but as Professor Kenneth Munda mentioned, and then what? So what is your view? And 
I mean, one of the things I was expecting to hear a little bit about is really about the tensions between investment law broadly and, and the area of sovereign debt. And you mentioned this in your response um, to the commentary, but it would be good in your conclusion and very early on in your paper even to, to let us know what are you thinking and what do you, what do you actually propose? So that is on the first paper. So on the second paper, it, it's quite an interesting idea um, that uh, has been proposed to, to negotiate debt as a block. It's very complicated and it raises so many questions and so many thoughts came to my mind when I was reading the paper and when we provide the, the written comments, I'll, I'll document these. But a few things that came to my mind, which I guess some of them you will um, look into once you um, consult with uh, some legal um, scholars or experts, is how exactly do we renegotiate as a block? And I guess here uh, you did mention some of the limitations, you mentioned political limitations, economic limitations, and I was surprised to see that you didn't mention, um, that the two authors did not mention the, techni uh, the technical challenges. So for instance, we have different, we have 16 countries with different debt profiles, different creditors, different um, debt terms. I'm not sure if the focus was really on uh, negotiating on official debt and how would this third party actually do the negotiating and what would be the legal basis for them to do it? And I guess in the response, you have, I guess, alluded to, you have alluded to them providing a forum or a platform for the negotiations. Um, possibly I weaned out that maybe this, um, this uh, commission that you have proposed might be providing technical, um, technical assistance. I, I know the African Legal Support Facility has been helping quite a lot of um, African countries with their debt renegotiations, especially on the litigation side. I'm not sure if there's anything to, to learn there. Uh, one aspect I was quite surprised to not really see mentioned as a limitation is the issue of transparency uh, when it comes to the terms of a lot of these different debt, um, debt contracts, especially, um, um, I could say, uh, the debt um, that has been um, obtained from certain bilateral creditors that are I guess known to not be the most transparent. So is there a need for a transparency initiative within the SADC region? So I was expecting to, and hoping to see a little bit more on the issue of transparency. Um, I know that the World Bank does have some information on transparency. I guess it's mostly with my bilateral and official debt, but maybe a little bit more research is needed on this. Um, you discourage the use of euro bonds so are euro bonds bad in themselves or um, is the issue that they're oversubscribed? Um, maybe the currency um, using this foreign currency uh, bonds is, um, is bad, but not always. So I was just asking myself that, do you discourage euro bonds in their totality? Are there instances where um, African countries have issued euro bonds um, and have repaid these bonds and, um, and everything is okay. And if you're discouraging these of euro bonds, how do we feel that, um, that, uh, that financing gap? So I guess maybe it speaks to some of the other papers, especially I guess on the first session, uh, authors like Amita Mehta provided some interesting ideas of innovating financing. I, I believe Barry Herman as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, if we discourage euro bonds, should we be providing a different, uh, an alternative solution or a list of solutions? I mean, maybe this goes beyond the scope of, of, of the paper. Uh, streamlining public debt management laws, interesting um, and probably much needed. I haven't done much research on this myself, but um, is really the issue that these laws need to be streamlined or maybe, which is, which is challenging. You have common law countries in SADC, you have civil law countries that have different traditions. Is it that we need a model public procurement law in SADC? I'm not entirely sure if a, a lot of work has been done on this, but if we're also looking at public um, debt management laws, should we also be looking at public procurement laws as well? I'm not entirely sure. Um, and maybe these are a few things that you might think about. But the idea is very interesting, um, and it's 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 a 
complex one and maybe it requires a little bit of rethinking about the, the role of this commission. Should they really be renegotiating debt? Can they actually legally do so? And I guess a final question is, should, should we be acquiring our debt as a block? Um, is it only at the renegotiation uh, time? Um, I guess maybe that question does not really become relevant if this body that you propose is really just to provide technical assistance to, to, these, um, to these particular countries. And, and of course, there's the obvious questions as who's going to be financing this body. Um, I guess they'll need a secretariat and so forth. Uh, the last question I found very, um, the last paper I found very interesting as well, um, the legal options for, for debt, uh, debt restructuring. Um, and I guess just on a broader perspective, I guess maybe the paper does require some rethinking on the general structure. Um, so maybe a few ideas, and I think one of them, uh, Professor Makami may have already mentioned, and even I guess uh, Dr. Selene Tan also, and, and I guess Kenneth provided a broad, um, a broad view on this is really about the fact that you have these defenses that I guess arise in your debt recovery litigation. You also have these contractual clauses like collection action clauses. Um, so maybe you, you, it wasn't particularly clear what the options are and also the, the discussion on each option was very narrow. Um, could it be that you've discussed you, too many issues and that has prevented you from doing a very in-depth study? Um, of course, um, uh, Prof. Bradlow and I need to probably rethink and discuss the issue of word counts, but within the word count, could you maybe limit your discussion? And one idea is, should there really be a discussion on the uh, concept of odious debt? Of course, this is uh, when we're talking about um, um, how do we restructure after COVID-19? Um, so yeah, so maybe this is something you'd have to think about, maybe narrow the scope and have a more in-depth discussion. And, and all the commentators have provided quite a lot of questions that arise because there wasn't a, the most in-depth um, in discussion. Um, and maybe um, an, an idea really is, is um, in your conclusion, could you possibly provide um, I guess a conclusion on the best options, which you have discussed, you've mentioned, for instance, collective action clauses, which you've mentioned uh, that most African countries don't have in their uh, bond contracts, for example, and maybe those kind of points need to be substantiated. So those are just my thoughts that this paper does need some sort of a conclusion that's more conclusive. Um, but Danny, um, those are just the very general um, thoughts I had when reading the paper. So thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Great, thanks Magali. Um, I don't see any other hands uh, and I'm aware that uh, time is moving on. And the commentators have been so, the commentaries have been so rich and thought provoking and given so much additional th thinking that they've covered um, a, a lot that I was going to say, in fact, between all of them, there's nothing I can say on Rosalian's paper that wouldn't be repetitive. So I'm not just going to I'm not going to repeat anything. There are just a couple of comments I want to make on the other two papers that I don't think have been made directly, um, just by way of adding to the discussion. So on Jervin and Umesh's paper, um, one of the things is that struck me reading the paper is one of the concerns mentioned in the paper is that debt arrangements, and particularly if you get into trouble with your debt and have to renegotiate and go to the IMF, raises concerns about sovereignty, um, which I always find somewhat of an intriguing point when it's raised, particularly in regard to the IMF, because it seems to me every time a government, a state enters into a, a treaty or into a contract, it's limiting its freedom of action in some way. And um, I'm not sure why the IMF is particularly worse than entering into other kinds of treaties, but it seems to me that the, the structure you're proposing to have negotiations as a block would impose even more restrictions on sovereignty of the countries than, um, than is the case now. And I was wondering how you would balance that and why you so confident uh, that countries would be willing to accept those limits. 
I was thinking, for example, if you're thinking about Zambia at the moment with its debt problems, would it feel better dealing as it is now on its own with its creditors or dealing in a block where it has to take into account the fact or the, the committee, the structure you're proposing would have to take into account the fact that Mozambique is also having debt problems, Angola's got debt problems, other countries in the region might have debt problems and balancing all that out might be um, to the detriment of Zambia, even though it might work to the, the benefit of the whole region. And so I think uh, the sovereignty issue um, is, is an important one that probably needs a bit more thought in your paper than so far. Um, taking, and I take Magali's point that the word limit that we've given you uh, obviously is a serious constraining issue. Um, on Muriuki's paper, a lot has been said already, and I, I don't want to repeat uh, uh, that, but two things. One is on the odious debt issue. Um, even, I mean, the first issue, and I, I think Makani was the first person to raise this, is um, whether or not it's considered as um, uh, customary international law. It, it always seems to me that the uh, odious debt is a great advocacy point for, for debtors and their allies but it's not clear from a legal point of view how useful it actually is. Um, I mean, it, it's a very hard uh, issue to prove. Um, it's unclear what, it's unpredictable, and it's never succeeded to the best of my knowledge in, in the actual litigation or arbitration. Um, and if you win, what will you actually get? Um, you'd win the case, but, um, and this was a, uh, an issue, I mean, because the, the the clearest case of an odious debt in our region anyhow was the apartheid debts uh, of the apartheid regime and there was always there was a lot of discussion in 94 as to whether the, the the democratic government that came to power at that point should just say that the debts of the apartheid regime are odious and that it's not going to pay them and the response was always well what do you get for that all you'll get is your creditors will say, well, congratulations, you've won that in court now, but don't come to us for any more money after this. Um, and is that really worth uh, the benefits that you, uh, in the long run? So I think it, it's, it's an issue that's important to keep raising for, because of its advocacy potential. But I think as, as a legal matter, we always need to be somewhat skeptical about its utility. The other thing which you didn't mention in the, a presentation today that you raised, which I found really intriguing, uh, was the use of Article 8.2b of the IMF Articles of Agreement. Uh, and there, uh, that, that provision, which is a very uh, tortured language provision, but that's saying that if a country introduces exchange controls consistent with its obligations at the IMF, other countries should help enforce that. Um, it's a really interesting issue to raise. Uh, the thing that struck me about it is it made me wonder why more countries have not been resorting to exchange controls at this time. Um, I mean, it seems to me that the, I, the need to preserve resources is a, as great as it is, but many countries have chosen not to, or are not, I don't know if they've chosen, but they're not imposing new exchange controls in any significant numbers. Uh, and it, I thought that was good food for thought, and I don't know the answer to why that is, but I thought that was something that would be worth thinking about. Um, I think in the interest of time, uh, I, we've had such a rich discussion, I think it's a good time to bring this to a close. I, I want to thank the three presenters for, for really interesting papers, for stimulating a great discussion today. I, I want to thank our three commentators who, who really are the model of what you want from commentators. Uh, and to really thank you for your work in reading through the papers and for your comments and for the generosity of, of what you've offered to the commentators. Uh, one of the things that struck me and, and um, in this and in the previous workshops, and I, I don't think Magali and I can take credit for this because we didn't plan it this way, um, but the, the papers have been done by young African scholars, and many of the commentary has been done uh, by older scholars and more senior scholars. And I think that's, that's a wonderful outcome. It's really exciting to see how many talented young scholars there are on the African continent addressing these important issues of debt. Um, and so I, I want to comment, welcome everyone and congratulate the, com the 
the scholars for the papers that they're developing and to say that really gives me uh, encourages me uh, that this project is really worth doing and that we'll come up with some a book that we can make a real contribution to our region and hopefully to the whole African continent. Um, and I, in that regard, just to reiterate the, the point that Professor Mbengu made about the importance of citing African scholarship in this to promote that. And as Magali said, to use as many African examples as possible, but taking into account Kenneth's point about um, uh, the importance of comparative work. Um, and finally, I want to thank OSISA, the Open Society Initiative for Southern Africa for the financial support for this project. Um, and I want to also thank um, Simpiwe Kumalo, who most of you haven't seen, but has been in the background uh, working really hard to make sure that the technology works well and that these sessions are recorded so that if anyone wants to, they'll be able to observe them. Um, and to thank all of you for participating. Um, some of you I know have participated in all four workshops and I want to thank you for your support and to tell you that we, we Magli and I will work hard to make sure this book comes out in a timely fashion so that these papers can make a contribution uh, as we go forward, because we know, uh, unfortunately, that African countries are likely to suffer, or more African countries are likely to suffer debt problems uh, over the next year. And we would like to make sure that that can be dealt with as, pain, as painlessly as possible. Um, with that, I think I want to thank you, everyone, again, um, and declare the meeting closed and say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Magali. Thank you, and bye. Good one. Stop me, Andy. Somebody, talk to me again. Talk to me again. Come.